Hi everyone. So uh, in lieu of some readings today, because this is kind of a niche topic, you're not going to find many accessible readings on it that actually gather a more broad view of it. And kind of what I mean by this is that these are going to be mostly different approaches to how we look at stained brain tissue. And each of these approaches probably has its own general guide on how it works. But then there isn't really a guy that explains things in simple language, yet covers all of these at the same time without just kind of pulling out excerpts from a textbook. And even then, it doesn't really give you a full appreciation for why we do these things. So that is what this little discussion, well, lecture is going to be about today. So without further ado, I have some slides to go along with this brief talk, and we can look at those. So, all right. So, when we're taking out the brain and actually sectioning it down, this is what we can call post mortem tissue analysis. Uh, in other words, looking at the tissue after death. And you may be wondering, well, isn't it just kind of a big glob of goop if we try to take it out of the skull? Normally, yes. We need to preserve brain tissue by fixing it in place, as they say. Uh, and so by using certain things called fixatives, we can take the brain tissue and not harden it completely, but make it quite rigid so that it can be sectioned down. And so these sections actually hold up and have a much better chance of being able to be transported, stained, and treated in different ways without segmenting and um, disintegrating apart. Otherwise, the consistency of the sections of tissue that we'd normally be working with is something that's far more delicate than even wet tissue paper uh, shreds super easily. So brain tissue normally needs to be treated in some way in order to look at it whether it's frozen in place or it is fixed, as they say, using chemicals like formaldehyde, for instance. So things like embalming fluids, those are meant to preserve specimens by causing all the proteins to get stuck together and maintain their shape. And this also prevents stuff from digesting it like microbes, bacteria, fungi, and so on and so forth. It also has the added effect of kind of freezing things in time. So one of the reasons why we look at postmortem tissue in this way is that when we use formaldehyde, where when we freeze it, it will, as per the name, freeze things in the state that they were at right at that moment. So we'll not have to worry about things decaying or chemical processes still going on that do occur after cell death. So once we have this brain tissue and it's prepped and ready, what do we do with it? Well, we can't really do much with brain tissue as it is, like a giant hunk of brain is not really gonna be very usable in its form. So we have to section it down, or slicing, you can call that. So it is not that dissimilar to using a deli slicer. <laughs> You'll see a quick little video excerpt in a little bit. But generally, all the following methods that we're gonna go over involve converting the brain into smaller and far more usable pieces. So that is the section process where effectively it is slicing and either the brain is frozen in order to make it super rigid and it is cut through with a razor blade or a razor blade is vibrated through a room temperature hunk of brain and it separates that amount into very thin layers. Layers that are 50 micrometers thick. So that is 1 20th of a millimeter thick to give you a basis of comparison. And here we have some images of human brains being sectioned into much thicker slabs. So these are probably like one centimeter thick slabs uh, for reference of human brain tissue that has been fixed and all the blood has been flushed out, which is why it looks um, a little bit more uh, brown and tan. Once we have thin sections though, like this 50 micron section thickness, they can be stained, they can be viewed under microscopes, and when we are able to view them under microscopes, we can certainly compare them against that stereotax brain atlas I mentioned 
previously in class, of which this is one image from the rat brain atlas, looking at it from a top-down view. So as a few reminders of views of the brain, these brains here are viewed from the front on. The, this diagram here is the rat brain viewed from the top down. What are the names of each of those views? Moving on with other things, you may be wondering, well, why would we care about even sectioning down the brain aside from being able to stain it? Well, sometimes we wanna see what the general effects on anatomy are from certain surgeries. For instance, patient HM, uh, he is an important case for psychology studies on memory because he had a surgery to treat epilepsy, but this surgery was really invasive, really intense, and it scooped out parts of his brain that were involved with the formation of new memories. So he could remember old things, but he could not create new memories after a certain point in time being when the surgery happened. He died within the last uh, 10 or so years and his brain was donated to science. And there is a video clip that I have linked here. And these slides will be available to you later. Where his brain is being sectioned down by one such device. So let's take a look. Let me kind of orient you to what we're looking at here. Off to the bottom right, we have uh, the lab with its uh, respective workers here. and. One of them is manning this thing called a cryostat. So it's a chamber that keeps everything cold. Uh, this brain has been embedded in this freezing jelly stuff. So it's jelly when it's put around the brain, but then it's shaped into a block and then frozen in place. And this middle chrome colored strip here, that's actually a very thick blade that's uh, dragged across the top layer of this block of frozen jelly and brain chunk. So as the blade is dragged across, it'll separate off a 50 micrometer thin slice with the jelly surrounding it. And the technician will take a large paintbrush and then scoop it up and swab it off. So as it cuts this, you may be wondering, well, doesn't it just break into a million pieces? It turns out that as this uh, warmer blade cuts it, and the brain kind of folds and curls around, it does, uh, it does remelt and the brain doesn't disintegrate when it melts. It actually just becomes a clump that after they scoop it up with this paintbrush, they'll put it into a giant dish with fluid in it and the brain section unfolds and can be stained and uh, cut apart accordingly. And for those who are wondering what is going on here beyond that, uh, this is, I, I think this is Dr. Ramachandran's lab, or at least a lab that he collaborates with, in which they are sectioning this uh, famous patient's brain. All right, so this video kind of goes on, but uh, these pieces of equipment are meant for the sole purpose of sectioning the brain down in a consistent and repeatable manner. All righty, going back to here then. So as for what we can do with the stained brain, we've seen some pictures of the Nissel stain so far. So what is the Nissel stain? Well, it's named after this guy, Franz Nissel. And it's a specific type of stain that generally stains neurons a lot more than it stains other cells in the brain. And so it might look something like this. Areas that are uh, rich with fiber tracts, like uh, parts of the brain stem and inner parts of the brain, like the corpus callosum, those will not stain nearly as darkly as other areas of the brain that are rich in cell bodies of the neurons. So what it does is that it stains the gray matter purplish blue and it avoids staining the white matter, anything more than a tinge of those colors. And you may be wondering, well, why do we care about this? Well, recall from what we talked about in class that by staining them, uh, these brain regions, we can actually get different colors or different shades to pop out so that we can actually determine what the boundaries of these brain regions are. And this is similar to what happens with rat brains, where we can also use these uh, determining things, these sort of landmarks, to determine how well our surgical implants in some experiment had reached the target. 
So are they at the target? Are they far off from the target? These are important things that after an animal experiment where there was a surgery to implant an electrode or to implant something else, they need to take the brain out later on to figure out if they actually hit the target. Not that they were aiming for it in the surgery, but that it actually got there. So that's one of the important aspects of doing this missile stain to figure out where the landmarks are, to compare it versus an atlas, and then to figure out, okay, um, this is where we targeted, did it hit the spot? And then here's a much closer look at what it looks like when we zoom in. So this is part of the hippocampus for those who are wondering. And we see these different colored layers where this one isn't really stained, this one is stained very darkly. This one's more spotted in nature. And this is based on how densely packed the neuron cell bodies are compared to just other stuff like fibers going through the brain. And so keep this image in mind because we'll see it pop up again in a minute. So the initial stain will help us determine general features of the brain, makes gray matter versus white matter pop out more, makes different gray matter regions more distinct from each other. But it doesn't really tell us a lot more specific things about the brain. That's where other techniques come in. We've got immunohistochemistry. So breaking this term down, immuno means that it's using antibodies. We'll get to what exactly that means in a second. Histo just means tissue. Chemistry just means chemicals interact. So it's using the fact that antibodies, being a part of our immune system, will target really specific things. So you can actually create antibodies in lab settings to target anything that you want. When you, for instance, inject some sort of uh, random glob of protein into somebody's body, it will create antibodies because the immune system knows that, that thing doesn't belong. So you'll be able to take the blood, skim out those antibodies, and then be able to use those antibodies in these experiments, just in solutions. So these antibodies usually have some sort of colored label on them. And you can raise antibodies against pretty much any sort of protein, including all sorts of ones that we've covered in the brain. So glutamate receptors, dopamine receptors, even the neurotransmitters themselves. Uh, other clinical examples might be for looking at postmortem Alzheimer's plaques that form in the brain. And in this image, we have uh, a few different things going on. First, the blue stain that we have here is actually the Nissel stain. So we can do multiple types of stains and overlay them. Uh, so this brain was first Nissel stain, and then it was also, it went through the immunohistochemistry stain here, and that is more of a brown color. So the Nissel stain's blue, it gives us the highlights of where we are in the brain, and the brown color is for a specific target. It was for a protein that happens to be in astrocytes. So that's why they have this weird fibrous squiggly look to them, that these are astrocytes. An important thing is that immunohistochemistry can also be fluorescent. So in this case, we have an initial stain that is in a fluorescent blue, and then we have uh, the stain against these astrocytes or the protein marker in them being in a fluorescent green. We've got another technique that kind of works similarly but targets something different. They call it in situ hybridization or ISH for short. And in this way, we could look at genes of neurons, whether we're just looking at the base DNA or we're looking at some precursors to the proteins they make, mRNAs. And then there's this other technique called autoradiography, where it is a radioactive substance that binds to receptors and tissue and potentially other things. And so what they'll do is they'll have tissue in a bath, they'll use maybe radioactive drug like for instance, antipsychotics um, or amphetamine. So let's say that they use radioactive uh, amphetamine. And this radioactive amphetamine will go to where dopamine is put out in the brain. And so you'll have those areas of the brain that put out a lot of dopamine highlighted by this radioactivity in this one slice. And then they'll overlay these slices onto radiation sensitive film. And it might look something like these, where these are very shrunken down, sections looking at the side of the rat brain, and the increasing darkness suggests that there's increasing binding of the radioactive drug in some of these regions. Thinking about autoradiography, I mentioned 
a brain scan that actually works very similarly to this. What is that brain scan? I'll probably ask again when we talk about this on our Friday discussion. There are still more stains. For instance, track tracing. This is one that I've used uh, to a great degree. And there are a few different flavors of this, but generally it involves injecting chemicals into a live animal under anesthesia. These chemicals are trafficked to certain destinations, and then after we take the brain out and look at it post-mortem, we can see where the chemical went. There is retrograde tracing, which it sucks up this chemical in the live rat into the terminals of the neurons, and it goes backward up to cell bodies. So in other words, we usually think of the action potential going from the cell body down the axon to the terminals. This retrograde tracer chemical, or these chemicals that do this, go backward from that normal direction. So it'll get sucked up into the terminals, get traffic backwards up to the axon, to the cell body, and then it'll accumulate in the cell bodies. And what it does, as per this image up here, is it'll show where cells are in the brain that project to where the chemical was injected. So let's, let's think about this. What do I mean by this? Let's say we inject this uh, tracer chemical into the temporal lobe, because we talked about that recently with the brain anatomy stuff. If we inject one of these retrograde tracers into the temporal lobe, then we section down and stain the brain. We'll be able to see cell bodies that contain this tracer that are all throughout the rest of the brain. In other words, all these cells elsewhere in the brain send their terminals and axons into the temporal lobe where we injected the chemical. In contrast, there's anterograde tracing, meaning that it traces forward or the normal direction that uh, the action potential goes. And that's depicted with this lower diagram here on the right, <clears throat> where a chemical uh, is absorbed into the dendrites and cell body, gets sent down the axon, and eventually accumulates into the terminals. So it really highlights axons and terminals. And when you inject it into, let's say, the temporal lobe again, this anterograde tracer, it works differently in that it will highlight all the temporal lobe's terminals, where it sends all of its connections throughout the brain. Now this is all well and good, but sometimes we want to know a little bit more about the brain. And thus comes in one of the more interesting parts of this segment, which is the staining for recent activity. And we should keep in mind that stains are not just for showing structure, they can actually show a little bit about activity, or at least what we could deduce was a marker for activity. So what I mean by this is that there are certain proteins that change when neurons are more or less active than normal. And one of these proteins is called CFOS. So the CFOS protein is cranked up in neurons that have been highly active recently. And I, be, I mean within the last two hours. So CFOS accumulates really fast within two hours. People might think, no, oh, that doesn't sound so fast, but when we think about proteins existing in the body for days and days, two hours is pretty fast. So CFOS will kind of peak to a certain level after two hours and then drop off after four to eight hours. You don't need to know those specific numbers, but this just shows you what kind of time period some of these experiments might work on. And I have an example of both in images here and a quick diversion to a PDF I'll show in a bit, where you can use this to track where in the brain neurons were recently active when you ran an experiment. So I did an experiment, uh, it's a published paper as of earlier this uh, calendar year. And in this experiment, we were trying to inject a chemical into rats that made them disgusted to normally palatable sweet uh, things. And so things like sucrose solution, that's sugar water basically, rats love to lap up. We inject them with this drug, however, and they turn their response around to being utterly disgusted by it. And we were wondering, well, in addition to this response that the drug gives, what brain regions are being turned on to create this disgust? And so we looked to staining using that 
immunohistochemistry approach I mentioned before. We look to staining CFOS. So here are some images. This is a fluorescent image, and it might look like, oh, you know, this is a cool green blob or whatever. Uh, zoomed in way far into the one spot, one tiny part of the rat brain. Nothing is actually happening in this picture. You may be wondering what this green stuff is. And in fluorescent staining, there's normally some sort of uh, general color background. So despite this looking like something indeterminate, this will say doesn't really mean anything. So when the rat received no drug treatment, no discussed drug, nothing's really happening here. And we could tell that when we compare it to this image here with all these bright green dots in comparison. So in this brain region that we're really far zoomed in on, all these dots represent each one a neuron that was strongly activated during this discussed drug treatment. And so it suggests that this brain region was strongly activated during that drug treatment. So we're able to deduce or correlate this relationship between these brain regions staining brightly or darkly, depending how you see it, and whether this brain region was involved in a certain behavior or in a certain outcome in an experiment. Looking at it a little bit further, let me pull up this guy here. For reference, this is what a poster looks like that would be at a national convention. So this was a poster I showcased, I think back yeah, 2016 in the Society for Neuroscience Conference. And in this poster, we kind of see a layout to how things go. But one key point, and this carries over to PowerPoint presentations too for when you do your PowerPoint presentation project later on this semester. A key point is that we want to reduce words and emphasize pictures. Anywhere that you could reduce the amount of words on a sort of demonstration, it is ideal. Imagine that you're going between posters in a conference, and there are about a thousand of these per session per a day. That's a lot of posters, especially if you have a, a poster session that lasts for five days and there are two sessions each day. Um, if it's 2,000 per day, then we get up to 10,000 posters potentially to sift through. So people are going for certain topics, but they can't spend a lot of time if they're jumping all over the place and running across a giant convention hall. And therefore, you want to really minimize the amount that they have to read. They should be able to just figure it out by looking at some clear pictures of what's going on. And that's kind of what I worked with here. So if we zoom in a bit, hand tool, pull it over. We first start off with a diagram saying, oh, if we turn off this region, what other regions might be turned on? Uh, and that's what the drug was basically doing. Then I give some picture diagrams for the drug injection to the brain how we monitor the taste reactions in rats, what sort of experimental design it was. And then we get to the part that relates back to our topic of the day here, where we look at how this drug treatment in this one brain region, it'll elevate the CFOS protein, as I say here, in reward-associated brain regions, which seems kind of weird. So this discussed treatment seems to cause increased activity in a lot of different regions, and this is not even in an all-encompassing list, but we see some brain regions that we will see pop up later. So accumbens shell is one such brain region, uh, nucleus accumbens, more often known as, as well as the substantia nigra. These are both regions that we'll talk about as the class goes on. And so a key point is, you may be wondering, okay, this is a lot of trouble to go through just to look for neuron activity. Why not just look at it in the live rat? Well, if we think about how that works in a live rat, if we're trying to look at activity, the only way that we really do that is with brain scan or with electrodes that go straight into the brain. The problem with the electrodes going into the brain is that they can only look at one spot and maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 neurons. It's not that much, and you don't get really a good view across the whole brain. With brain scans, okay, you get a view across the whole brain, but it's not nearly as resolved enough, spatially uh, resolved or high spatial resolution. It's not able to give you that fine detail spatially to tell you, oh, there are specific neurons that are active at these points. Brain scans are never that detailed. They cannot determine what's happening on neuron-to-neuron -neuron basis. They can only tell you what chunks of brain are active versus not. So if we really want to go down in there and figure out, okay, what kinds of neurons are these? 
where are they active? Are they active in certain subregions of specific brain areas? The stains on sections of brain tissue will give you that resolution. And when you do it with a whole bunch of sections throughout a whole brain, you can get a detailed mapping of all these brain regions that were active at this time. And so that's why we use this approach rather than just sticking electrodes everywhere into a live subject. We also have stains for activity that may not be so recent, but is still important. So we have a few more terms thrown around here. It says CFOS, okay, this gives us an idea of that thing I mentioned before where it peaks at two hours and then diminishes around four to six hours or so. We have other sort of weird protein names like phosphy, fra, one, two, whatever. The one that we're interested in here is a specific type of delta phos B. So another random protein name, doesn't sound like anything to us um, since you guys are new to this, but let's, let's take a preface to what all this means. Research on drug abuse identified delta phos B as something of interest. So research on drug abuse is still a very large portion of neuroscience research. It's a heavy amount of funding into it to this day, uh, despite it being a thing that has been under research for decades so far. And this form of research has identified this specific type of protein, delta phos B, that is, from what they can tell, a marker of drug-induced activity, especially because various drugs of abuse will increase this delta phos B, DFB for short, in this nucleus accumbens region. This is one of the regions of the brain's reward pathway. And we will discuss that later, but this is just for example purposes that this will appear. And additionally, it's not even just that it appears, it's that it persists even after abstaining from drugs. So if somebody takes a drug of abuse, like they have amphetamine one time, after that amphetamine exposure, delta phos B will persist in this brain region in those cells for beyond four to five days. And each time that they take the drug, it will actually get topped off and increase again. And so with repeated usage, as shown by this chronic exposure, every time the use is repeated, let's say every half day, then it will cause the amount of this delta phos B stuff to really start to accumulate. Why do we care about this? Well, let's think about delta phos B. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to the why it matters and what it means in a second, but if we're seeing that this, this is a marker for maybe amphetamine addiction, methamphetamine perhaps, do you also think that this delta phos B stuff elevates in all addictions or perhaps just some other forms of addiction? And do you think if it does apply to other addictions of any sort, that that's specific to only drug addiction or perhaps addiction to other things. Let me know your thoughts on the Friday dialogue. However, as far as what CFOS and DFB actually are, aside from just globs of protein that seem to increase and decrease at different times, why these things are important is because they are transcription factors. And here's just another one of those technical terms, but transcription factors are just these proteins that can actually turn on and off specific genes, not only in neurons, but in other cells. If we're thinking about neurons, and we're thinking about the genes that control all sorts of properties of neurons, then this means that CFOS and DFB can also turn on and off certain behaviors and properties of neurons themselves. So this will cause changes in how the neuron is set up and structured. It might cause changes in axons and dendrites. It might cause changes in how the neuron, quote, behaves. Because we know that neurons don't behave like throwing a ball or something. But they have certain things that they just generally do, like they depolarize a certain amount to glutamate. They have action potentials. They send out neurotransmitters when certain things happen. If we think more generally about certain pieces and parts and processes of neurons that we've learned about, if we mess with genes, what things might be messed with? So that's another thing to think about for Friday. And then we'll get into a little bit more about what CFOS and delta phos B actually might do that is relevant to why they're created in the first place in response to neurons being turned on 
and then why it's problematic for drug addiction when something like Delta Boss B is still around doing its gene affecting uh, flicking on of uh, these gene switches on and off. Okay. So that's about it for what I wanted to talk about in this uh, brief sort of video lecture thing. And we'll talk more about this stuff on Friday. So see you then.